All right, I gotta warn you, in this video, we're gonna be talking about interaction terms. Now, interaction terms are fantastic. They pop up all over the place, especially in causal inference. In fact, there are a lot of causal inference research designs that are built around the use of interaction terms. So they show up a lot uh, in causal inference and in generally, you know, observational research designs a lot, overall, right? However, they are also very difficult to wrap your head around. Uh, so this is a video you might wanna bookmark it, watch it. Once you, anyway, when you come to an interaction term that you need to interpret or use, come back to it, watch it again, and go through the whole process. Because this is the best thing that, at least until you get the intuition for it, you're gonna wanna take, take it slow, do it one step at a time, uh, you know, don't be in a rush, and you'll get to the proper interpretation as long as you're willing to go step by step. So let's make sure that we can do that. So what is an interaction term? Well, if you think back to the polynomials or logarithms that we used before, uh, we were fitting a curvy line. We're basically saying that the effect of x on y should be different at different values on the x-axis, right? The effect would change along the range of the x. But what if instead of that, what if the effect of x changes for values of a different variable? So instead of the effect of x on y changing as the value of x changes, what if it changes as the value of z changes? Um, that could certainly happen, and so that is what we can use interaction terms to study. One of the most common ways in which this pops up is if we want to see the difference in a treatment effect across groups. If you think back to our heterogeneous treatment effect videos, we talked about conditional average treatment effects, uh, which was treatment effects that we estimated differently for different groups. Maybe there's one effect for women, and one effect, one effect for men, maybe there's one effect for tall people, one effect for short people, whatever this, blah, 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 whatever the things, right? This is one way of allowing ourselves to estimate conditional average treatment effects, because we are allowing the effect of x on y to be different across different values of another variable, which could be men versus women, or it could be tall versus short, or it could be whatever. So here's an example of an equation that has an interaction term included in it. So here we are regressing y on x, uh, and then we also have z as a control, and we also have x times z as the interaction term. Uh, so here, let's say that we are particularly interested in the effect of x, but we are allowing the effect of x to vary across the values of z. Now, something important to point out is that adding z as a control by itself does not do this. Just simply, if we, if we took out the interaction term and just focused on the x and the z part, it's a common misconception that adding a control for z allows the effect of x to differ across different values of z. This is not true. Uh, adding a value of z, as we change the value of z in our model, it moves that line up and down, but if you look at the slope on x, that stays the same. The, the, the line does not move around in terms of its slope, which is what we would want for the effect of x to be different. If the effect of x is this for one group and this for a different group, right, we're basically saying that the slope of x differs across those groups. And without the interaction term itself, that is not allowed to happen. We need that interaction term. The other thing to point out here is that I'm including z as a control by itself, even though I'm not particularly interested in it. This is something you pretty much always want to do. You pretty much never want to do x and the interaction term without also including the z that you are interacting with. Why is this? Well, omitted variable bias or backdoors. Uh, if we leave z out of the model, that means that it goes into the error term, right? Everything that's not in the model that determines y goes into the error term. Well. Uh, that interaction term, x times z, is definitely related to z, and so the coefficient on the interaction term would be mixed up. It would be, it would be, it would be combining both the effect of the interaction term and the effect of the z that's currently in the error term. We don't want that, so we definitely want to make sure that z stays in the model. All right, so the tricky thing about interaction terms is getting used to the idea of interpreting them. It's not that difficult once you get used to it, but it does take some getting used to. And to make things a little bit easier, let's assume that our z here is binary. This is one of the most common ways that you'll be using interaction terms anyway, is to be interacting some treatment, whether that treatment is continuous or binary, with a binary interaction, uh, because you'll be comparing the effect of x across different groups. It's a very common application. And it also makes the interpretation a lot easier. So to interpret the coefficients, the thing that we're going to want to do is first we're going to want to get the effect of x. And you might be thinking, well, hold on, there it is, it's beta 1, but no, actually that's not the effect of x. Because x shows up in two different places in this model. And so the effect of x is going to be how, when as x changes, how does y change? Well, that change is going to be reflected in two different parts of the model. We need to reflect that. So let's take the derivative. This is the first thing that I always recommend doing, especially if you're starting out working with interaction terms, is to just sit down and write up the equation and then take the derivative of y with respect to x. And this is what you get. So you'll notice that the, co the derivative, the effect of x on y, uh, is beta 1, which was the coefficient on x, plus 
beta 3 times z, which uh, beta 3 was the coefficient on the interaction term. This is the effect of x, and if we want to know what the effect of x is, we have to plug in some value of z. It is conditional on the value of z that we pick. So you can already see how interpreting this is going to be a little bit easier if z is binary. Now all the math, all the things that I'm about to describe still work if z is continuous. It just takes an extra mental step to sort of get it in your head. So we're going to stick with binary. So the first thing let's do is let's look at that beta 1 coefficient. What is that? Well, that's the effect of x on y when z is 0. Right? If I plug in z is 0, if I'm in the z is no group, we're talking about a binary z, then z equals 0, that beta 3 times 0 term drops out, and all we are left with is the beta 1, which tells us that beta 1 is the effect of x on y among people for whom z is 0. So for the z is 0 group, beta 1 is the effect of x on y. I'm, I keep saying the effect of as though we're causally identified, let's just assume we are, it makes it easier to talk about. Okay, great, that is beta 1 settled. So then let's think about, okay, well that's the effect for the z equals 0 group. What about the z equals 1 group? Well, let's plug z equals 1 into this equation. What do we get? Well, that z turns into a 1, uh, so we end up with beta 1 plus beta 3. So therefore, the effect of x on y among the z equals 1 group is beta 1 plus beta 3. Great, so now we have the effect for the z equals 0 group, the effect for the z equals 1 group. So how about the beta 3 by itself? Well, here's an interesting thing. Let's look back at this derivative right here. You might realize that this looks very similar to what we had before when we regressed y on a binary indicator, right? The equation looked a lot like this. It was y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times our binary indicator, right? And in that case, the binary, the coefficient on the binary variable gave us the difference in means uh, between the y equals 0, the z equals 0 group and the z equals 1 group, right? It showed us the different, how the mean of y differed across those two groups. Same idea here, except here our left-hand side is the derivative of y with respect to x. So, what is beta 3 telling us? Beta 3 is still the difference across the groups, right? It's still what we get when we go from z equals 0 to z equals 1. But now instead of getting the mean of y, we're looking at the effect of x on y. So, beta 3 is the difference in the effect of x on y between the z equals 1 group and the z equals 0 group. It's how the effect changes when you go from z equals 0 to z equals 1, which you can also see from the calculations we already did, right? Because what was the effect for the z equals 0 group? Beta 1. What was the effect for the z equals 1 group? Beta 1 plus beta 3. What's the difference between those two things? Beta 3. So, beta 3 is the difference in the effect of x on y between the z equals 0 group and the z equals 1 group. It's how, it's how much the effect changes as you go from one group to the other. Which also means that the interaction, the coefficient on the interaction term itself uh, gives us a test of whether the effect is different in those two groups. Let's look at a table. Here's a table from the book. Let's focus on that third column over there because that is one that has a binary variable uh, being interacted, which makes it nice and easy to interpret. So what do we got here? We are regressing health inspection scores on the number of locations that a chain restaurant has, uh, whether it is currently the weekend or not, the interaction between those two number of locations times weekend, and then also we have a control for year of inspection. So what do we have? We have a coefficient on number of locations of negative 0.019, we have a coefficient on the weekend of 1.759, and we have a coefficient on the interaction term of negative 0.010. How can we interpret these? Well, the effect of number of locations is uh, that same derivative that we had before. It's the coefficient on number of locations plus the coefficient on the interaction term times whether it's the weekend or not. That, those are our two things. So if it is not currently the weekend, that second part goes away. And the effective number of locations in non-weekend times is negative 0.019. Great. Okay, now what if it is the weekend? If it is the weekend, then the effect, uh, then the weekend is 1, and so we have to add both the coefficients together. So the effect is negative 0.019 plus negative 0.010 for a total of uh, negative 0.029. Great. Okay, so then, finally, how much different is the effect of number of locations in the weekend versus not in the weekend? The difference in the effects is given by the interaction term, and so we would say that the effect is 0.010 different on the weekend than it is during the week. We also notice that this is not a particularly strong effect. We don't have statistical significance here, so we do not have enough evidence to reject that these effects are the same on the weekend and during the week. All right, so that's how we can interpret an interaction term. And it'll take you some time to get used to doing it intuitively. I know that it feels very confusing, but once you've done it a number of times, it will become second nature. There is a one more thing that I do want to say about interaction terms, which is to watch out with their use. You want to make sure that you have a reason to use them. They can get a little bit addicting and tempting, and you can lead to bad places. Why is that? Well, here's the thing. You know, if we're looking at the effect of a treatment, and we think, we could always think, well, I wonder if the effect of treatment differs across gender, or where you live, or how tall you are or your hair color, or your eye color, 
or whatever. There, you know, it could be the case that the treatment might differ across those things. I mean, it could, why not? But if you try all those things, well, you're gonna get some false positive. Uh, interaction terms tend to be relatively noisy. I mean, think about what you're doing. If you have a binary interaction term, we're basically estimating each effect using half of the sample size that we already have. So we're having the sample size and estimating these effects, things are gonna get noisy pretty quickly. So if you have noisy estimates and you make a bunch of them, there's a pretty good chance that you're gonna find some statistical significance, even if there's not really anything there. So you don't wanna go fishing. So before you add an interaction term to your model, you wanna make sure that you have a reason why you're adding that interaction term. Don't just add it to try it out and see what's there, right? You don't wanna like run your model and be like, okay, I didn't find much of an effect for the treatment, but I wonder if maybe the effect only exists for women uh, who live in Arkansas and are blonde. Like maybe, I don't know, you could try it, but if you try enough combinations like that, you'll find something and you don't wanna do that. All right, that's my warning about interaction terms. And also, you know, we all know, we now at this point know how to interpret them as well. Thank you. Thank you.